Okay, so to talk about the benefits of sex, let's first go back to our card game analogy. So in this analogy, we're gonna change it up just a little bit. So say you won a game of poker with a very good hand and your friend wants to play a new game now. And this new game has a totally different set of rules. So for example, maybe face cards are now worth the least amount of points, right? So in that situation, I want you to take a minute to think about what would be the smart thing to do and to answer it on the side here with play pause it. Okay, so in a situation where you can't predict what the next set of rules are or the rules that made you successful the first time aren't going to make you successful the second time, that is when there's an advantage to shuffling those alleles back into the deck and seeing what your offspring get, all right? So when the rules change, between games, it's to your advantage to shuffle cards which in this right are metaphors for alleles back into the deck and draw a new combo so we're going to look at a situation now where the rules change and the rules tend to change in a way that makes the winning hand of one generation a bad hand for the next generation. Okay, so when we talked about the cost of sex, we talked about shuffling, uh, breaking up a good hand, right? When we're going to talk about the same idea of generating novel um combinations of alleles as a benefit, we're going to call it the rapid generation of novel genotypes. And it's a benefit when the selection regime changes from generation to generation. Okay. And, and sex can cause this rapid generation through this mechanism that we already wrote and talked about before that through recombination, Meiosis provides opportunities for crossing over, which creates gametes with unique alleles, which can be an advantage in some situations and not an advantage in others. And right now we're gonna explore when selection regimes change between generation to generation, okay? So here's our case study. This is one of the best studied systems uh, on this idea. The New Zealand mud snail, not very noble of a name, um, but super common. And what's interesting about them is they have both sexual and asexually reproducing individuals in the same location. So same population, some individuals reproduce sexually and others reproduce asexually. And they can't switch. They're, they're either sexual or asexual, okay? And what researchers have noticed is that at some locations, there's more sexual individuals than others. So if you look at this map of New Zealand, um, you have all these circles and each circle represents a snail population. Right? So each circle is a snail population. And the percent of black is the or the amount of black in the circle is the percent of males in the population and so the only time you have males is if there's sexual reproduction happening so populations that are purely white they're all reproducing asexually and then populations that have white and black have a mix of sexual and asexual Okay, so you can see that looking across all of New Zealand, that there is a range of um, strategies used for reproduction, right? Some populations have a lot of sexual individuals, some have none, okay? 
So researchers wanted to understand this. Why? Why do you see this difference? Why are some populations more likely to have sexual individuals and some don't have any at all? All right, so we're gonna zoom in and focus on three populations. Okay, so here's a graph and on that y-axis are five years, so 2001 to 2005. Oh, sorry, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the relative fitness of sexual individuals to the fitness of asexual individuals, so comparing the fitness of these two reproductive strategies, okay? So basically, you're dividing the number of offspring left by sexual individuals divided by the number of offspring lost by, left by asexual individuals. If they leave the same number of offspring, then you get a one. So the one means equal fitness. All right, so I'm gonna show you these three populations and you're gonna get an activity asking you to predict which populations um, will have sexual individuals evolve. So take a minute to look at the data and, and answer that question. All right, so to get that question right, you had to be thinking back to the costs of sex. Remember the twofold cost of sex. The cost of males is that you are half as good, right, at leaving behind offspring because essentially your reproductive can your reproductive potential is constrained by males who don't produce their own offspring. So for sex to evolve in a population, you have to have at least twice as high fitness as in repro or asexual lines. So if you just looked at, is, is it over one, you missed it because you weren't thinking about the costs of sex. The cost of sex means that the sexual individual has to do twice as well as the asexual individual. So now take a moment and tell me which populations you think are gonna evolve sexual individuals. All right, so what do we conclude from this slide? It seems like Sexual females usually have higher fitness. Than asexual ones. Right, so usually they're above one, the sexual individuals. And in some years, sexual individuals is at least two times that of asexual individuals in the red and blue populations. This is enough. This, like the two X is enough to overcome the twofold costs of sex. But it's really only in those two populations, okay? So we would predict that we might see sexual individuals in those two populations, but why is that true for red and blue, but not for green? Well, here's what happened. Researchers further observed that 
red and blue had more parasites on and in them than the green population. The red and blue population had a higher parasite load. And the researchers continued this study. So they looked at all the sites in New Zealand where they had snail populations, and they found that this pattern was a general trend. So intensity of infection by parasites okay, is the x-axis here on this graph. And then the frequency of males, was a, which is a proxy for <clears throat> frequency of sexual reproduction is on the y-axis. And you can see that we've got a relationship here. As the intensity of infection by parasites go up, so does the number of individuals reproducing sexually. So the question becomes, how does parasite load relate to changing selection pressures between generations, right? Which is when we said sex was beneficial because it um, creates new combinations, right? So how do parasite loads relate to a benefit of sex? So this slide is gonna be a lot of writing, so hang in there. But here's how it works. This is the Red Queen hypothesis, um, and we'll, in a minute I'll, I'll tell you why they call it that. Um, but first, let's go through this. So parasites tend to have a lot of genetic variation in their population. So that can cause rapid evolution, and they have another benefit that you might not think about as a benefit. They're short-lived. But it's a benefit when we're talking about evolution because evolutionary change occurs between generations, right? It's the change that is passed on to the offspring. So it occurs between generations. So rapid turnover of generations means rapid evolution, okay? So not only do they have a lot of genetic variation, which allows selection to act uh, very well, but they also have this kind of fast turnover. So both of these things allow them to rapidly adjust or evolve to overcome a host's defenses. So they're rapidly evolving to overcome the snail's immune system, essentially, right? And now, now what happens? Now let's talk about an asexual lineage. So snails that are reproducing asexually These guys are, are slow to adapt. Now, 
new, and this is because new combinations of alleles can only arise by mutation. There's no shuffling back into the deck for them, right? They get the genome that they get and their offspring get that genome with no change unless there's mutations. That is a slow process. Okay, so because most mutations are deleterious, right? So not only are we waiting for mutations, but most are deleterious or neutral, and it's only rare that there's a beneficial one. So that really slows down evolution for these guys. So that means for the parasite, parasites can adapt to snail defenses. and essentially win. So they decimate their population because asexual individuals slow to change. Right, That slowness to change is an advantage when you're in a stable environment, but when you have something that's evolving to your defenses, evolving with the purpose of overcoming them, you need to move rapidly and you need to be able to make changes fast. Right, Asexual lineages cannot do that. So let's talk about sexual lineages. So sexual lineages, on the other hand, shuffle genomes and produce novel allele combinations that parasites haven't seen before. Among these variations, Maybe a new combo more resistant to the dominant parasite phenotype. So the sexual lineage can do better because it's creating these novel genotypes, right? These novel allele combinations that the parasite has never seen. And because it's doing all this shuffling, it's got a better chance of coming up with a combo that's more resistant. All right. But here's the deal. This, this pattern never ends. So, but parasite... keeps adapting, right? The parasite is still evolving. And so now it's evolving to the new phenotype. Of host. And the cycle continues forever. in the sexual lineage. 
the sexual lineage can never put down its guard or the parasite wins. But that's still better than the asexual lineage because whereas the asexual lineage probably just dies out, right? They can't evolve quick enough to, to outwit the parasites. And so the parasites win and eventually probably kill off that lineage. Sexual lineages can evolve quickly because they're doing this genome shuffling. And so they present this moving target to the parasite and the parasite is moving to keep up. You can't see my hand gestures, but think about a race, right? There's two people racing. They both want to be ahead of the other. And, and in that way, they are staying parallel to each other, right? One is not, maybe gets ahead a little bit at one point, but the other one can catch up and, and things like that. And so we've seen this before and we've called it something. So I want you to take a minute. Um, and again, in Play Positive, a question is going to pop up. What kind of selection is this? What kind of mode of selection? Yeah, so this is negative frequency dependence, right? When something becomes common, then then the 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 parasite evolves to it, and then when the parasite, whatever phenotype the parasite has, become common, then the the sexual lineage evolves against it, and so you have this what we call arms race. Okay, so let's summarize all this, and I can tell you now why we call this the Red Queen hypothesis. So the Red Queen comes from the Alice in Wonderland story. So this helps some people remember this, not others, depends on how much you like that book. But the idea there is that the Red Queen is running faster and faster but all she's doing, all that is doing is helping her stay in place, right? Because the idea here is that the parasite is also evolving quickly to catch up with you. So you have to run really fast just to make sure you don't fall behind, but you never get ahead because there is an organism evolving to your evolution, okay? So we had this, this phrase about three recombination, meiosis provides opportunities for crossing over, creating gametes with unique alleles. The advantage of that is to rapidly adapt to changing conditions due to coevolution, the sort of negative frequency dependent evolution where two organisms are evolving to adjust to each other of or other organisms. So I'm going to summarize this more generally. It doesn't have to be parasites. It can be anything. In fact, we probably are, I hope we're going to get to later on, that it can be sexes that are evolving resistance to each other um, because they don't always have each other's best interests um, aligning with their own fitness. So in general, all organisms... are in evolutionary arms races or co-evolving. They're trying to one-up each other with other organisms. This is almost always true. Um, and that's why sex is, is possibly so common, right? So when the selection pressures are the same across generations, that's more like an abiotic environment, right? Where, you know, the temperature is pretty steady over hundreds of years, right? But when an organism is evolving to your defenses, 
in the next generation or even the generation after that, what was good for the parent may not actually be good for the offspring. So the example that we used here was pathogens evolve rapidly to defeat host's defense system or immune system, essentially. But it doesn't have to be that. It could be predator-prey. It could be a crab evolving stronger claws to break the shell of a snail that's its prey, and then the snail evolving a stronger shell to resist that breaking. So the crab has to get a stronger claw, and then the snail gets an even stronger shell, and it just keeps going. It's an arms race. So when you have this coevolution, it creates a shifting adaptive landscape if it's a suite of traits or selection pressures where traits or alleles that produced high fitness in one generation may not produce high fitness in the next. Okay. So this is when sex is an advantage. Recombination through meiosis can increase the frequency of rare combinations of alleles that might, I'm sorry, my cat is using the litter box in the middle of this video, so that's amazing. Uh, I hope you can't hear it, but I can hear it. That might be better at defending a species. Okay, so if we go back to our card game analogy, evolutionary changes in other organisms So if what you are, what your selection pressure is, is evolving itself, it changes the rules that you play by. So evolutionary changes in other organisms change the rules about what cards are best. When the rules are changing, in that case, changing cards
could be the winning strategy. Okay, that's the red queen hypothesis. When other organisms are evolving to adapt to you, then you have to evolve quickly so that they don't completely overwhelm you and win, right? You, but you, as you are essentially running as fast as you can to stay at the same pace as the other organism, and sex helps you run that quickly. So one of the benefits of sex is the rapid generation of novel phenotypes when selection pressures change from generation to generation. There's one other benefit of sex. And this benefit is also a big one, right? It's pretty common for us to be co-evolving with other organisms, but this is even more common, all right? So what sex does that can be an advantage is it separates alleles from their genomic background. Okay. So if you're an asexual species, the genome, you pass on your entire genome, right? You're just cloning yourself. The genome is inherited all together. And when this happens, the fate, so, so, the fate of an allele depends on the alleles around it. Selection can't just act on one allele because that allele is never separate from the genetic background. It's never in a different combination. It's always in the same set of genes, right? So selection is actually acting on the entire set of genes. But sex allows selection to more efficiently spread beneficial alleles and remove deleterious alleles. The other thing, again, because sex through recombination can lead to a mixing of genes from different individuals, the other thing that it can do is bring together beneficial mutations from different lineages. So that arose in different lineages. So let's look at an example of this. You're gonna get an activity where I'm asking you to look at these two populations, population one on the left and population two on the right, and tell me in which population will the beneficial mutation spread. And so let me orient you to these figures. So each row essentially is an individual. If there's a red um, area like here, 
that is a deleterious mutation and written on top of it is the fitness consequence of that mutation. So the fitness coefficient, all right? If there's a blue, then that is our beneficial mutation. But remember that in an asexual population, which is what we're looking at, the, at, that the genome is inherited together, right? So to figure out the fitness of the individual, you have to add up the fitness of all the individual mutations. So tell me in which species the, a, the, the beneficial mutation spreads, in which population? Okay, so as you went through this, you probably saw that in population one, the fitness of individual three is lower than the fitness than the fitness of individual two. So if individual two and three are competing, which lineage is gonna spread? It's individual two. And so that beneficial mutation is going to be lost in that population, not because it doesn't have a benefit, but because the genomic background that it appeared in had so many mutations. So you're going to lose that beneficial mutation. It's not going to spread. Whereas in population two, an individual three has the highest fitness, and so it will spread. All right, so what I wanted you to write down and what I accidentally typed in here already is that asexual species, again, an allele's fate is determined not just by itself, but by the other alleles in the genome and whether that genome outcompetes out another genome. The other interesting thing that's happening here is that say individual three outcompetes everybody else, well, individual three has a deleterious mutation. If that individual, that genome outcompetes everyone else, that deleterious mutation goes to fixation. It can go to 100%, not because it's good, it's deleterious, right? But because it's hitchhiking on the benefit of the good mutation, right? So again, the fate of an allele, whether it's deleterious or not, is not determined by itself, but, but determined by its context, by the genome that it's in. So this can mean the loss of beneficial alleles, or the spread of deleterious mutations piggybacking on um, advantageous alleles. So those are challenges of being asexual. What if two beneficial mutations arose in different individuals in an asexual population? Tell me what's going to happen to these two mutations. So again, I'm irritated with myself because I left the conclusion on here, but basically in an asexual species, if you have two different lineages with two different good mutations, they end up competing with each other. Right, so again, you're looking at the overall lineage and even though individual three had this really nice beneficial mutation, his overall um, is lower, right? And so um, competition between lineages will lead to loss of the more advantageous allele. Advantageous mutation. And you'll never get 
both mutations in the same individual, right? Because these lineages don't mix with each other. If you arise in one lineage, you stay in that lineage. And so to get to two new two mutations that are beneficial into the same lineage, you basically are waiting for the spontaneous mutation to occur in that lineage for both of them. All right, so let's summarize what we just kind of went through. So we already said these first two things. So, and again, with asexual reproduction, the genome is inherited all together. So the fate of an allele depends on the alleles around it. So that makes it hard to spread beneficial mutations, and this is because new beneficial mutations can be lost if arise in a genome with lots of deleterious mutations. If the genome has lower fitness than a genome without that beneficial mutation, you will lose that beneficial mutation. In addition, new mutations, new beneficial mutations, beneficial mutations that arise in different lineages compete with one another and one is lost. So that is one problem, right? It's hard to spread beneficial mutations for these reasons. The second problem with asexuality is that deleterious mutations may spread because they are in a genome with a beneficial mutation. Okay, so if a deleterious mutation is in a genome that has the highest fitness because there's a bunch of beneficial ones, it can go to fixation even though it harms the population. With sexual reproduction though, This is probably the most general benefit of sex, right? The host parasite red queen situation happens a lot, um, but, but this one happens everywhere. So with sexual reproduction through recombination,
beneficial mutations. can be separated. from any deleterious mutations. On the chromosome. Alleles do not have to be inherited together. They don't come as a package. They can be shuffled, right, individually like cards. On which it first appeared. And beneficial mutations from different lineages can be combined. So instead of always competing, if two lineages mate together, then those alleles come together and you can end up with both beneficial in mutations in the same individual. Those are huge advantages and they only come through recombination and through sex. So let's, so let's now focus in on sex allowing more efficient removal of deleterious alleles. So we talked about bringing together beneficial alleles, um, but now let's talk about removing deleterious alleles. So the challenge with deleterious mutations is that in any population, A relatively small number of individuals have the fewest deleterious mutations. Right, so in a population, there's a bunch of variation, right? And some individuals have fewer deleterious mutations than others. But those individuals that have the fewest are a small number. And due to genetic drift, our old friend, we know some of those individuals won't leave offspring. So some of those individuals that don't have mutations also don't lose offspring. And each time that happens, the most fit genotype fails to reproduce. in an asexual population. The fitness, let's say the mean fitness of the population is reduced and reduced permanently. Asexual individuals' populations don't have a way to get rid of mutations that are present in individuals because they inherit the whole genome together. So here's the thing with asexuality. Asexual individuals or lineages 
steadily and irreversibly accumulate mutations. Deleterious mutations is what we're focused on. Once they have them, they can't get rid of them until that lineage driven to extinction. So asexual organisms seem to be on a slow march to their own demise because they cannot get rid of the deleterious mutations that they spontaneously accumulate. Sexual populations, on the other hand, can purge. So sexual lineages can purge deleterious mutations because again, they can separate an allele from its genomic background. And specifically because recombination can generate individuals with allele combinations that exclude deleterious mutations. Okay, so look at this image on the right here. We've got two individuals, they both have deleterious mutations, but through recombination, they can produce an offspring that doesn't have any mutations. So produce offspring with no deleterious mutations. Now the other one has all of them, and that one probably dies off, right? But they've got this one offspring with no mutations, and that offspring probably has higher fitness and continues in the population. All right. So that's this idea of being able to separate alleles from their genomic background. It has advantages for removing deleterious alleles and also spreading beneficial alleles. So let's talk about our last example. And this is an example in humans. Even though we reproduce sexually, we have chromosomes that reproduce asexually that don't go through cross. And that is the Y chromosome. So the Y chromosome originated from a recombining X chromosome over 180 million years ago. We've done that research. We know where it comes from. But after that one event 180 million years ago, from that point onward, the Y chromosome has evolved asexually. Um, where, this should be where, not which. Whereas the X chromosome continues to experience recombination when it's present in females, right? Because you have two X's and they can cross over. But the Y chromosome can't cross over. So given what you've, we've just talked about, make some predictions about what is going to happen in the Y chromosome compared to the X chromosome. What are some challenges the Y chromosome is going to be facing? All right, so you've made some predictions. Now let me show you some of the data. So a data table is gonna pop up here. Here's our table. So don't worry about the parameters, but they're all just different ways of measuring deleterious effects. But what we're interested in is the columns. Um, so one of the columns is the spread of deleterious alleles. That might've been one of your predictions that there, you're gonna see a spread of those across the Y chromosome, and we have evidence from a lot of different ways of measuring it 
that that is happening and some pretty strong evidence as well. Um, we could also, we also see some evidence that negative mutations are impacting the spread of positive mutations on the Y chromosome. So all of these things are what we would expect in an asexual population, right? Because you can't separate the allele from its genomic context, from the context of all the other mutations on the Y chromosome. We also see negative mutations at different loci impacting the spree, spe, uh, spread of positive mutations. So negative mutations are slowing the spread of positive mutations. And we're seeing negative mutations hitchhiking with positive mutations on the Y chromosome. All those things are detrimental to the Y chromosome. And we see evidence of this. So our conclusions are this, the Y chromosome shows strong evidence of the cost of asexual reproduction. which is the inability to separate alleles from their context. The Y chromosome never goes through recombination. And so we've seen, we've, we have evidence that the Y chromosome has degraded through an accumulation of mutations. Whereas the X chromosome, which is able to recombine, has not experienced these things. So um, almost all of the 2,000 genes on the X chromosome have suffered loss of function mutations on the Y. So even though the Y is derived from the X, most of the genes that were present on the Y, they're still, you can tell they're still there-ish, but they've had mutations that make them no longer work. There are very few functional genes left on the Y chromosome. In addition, Y has lost more than 60% of the DNA carried on the X. So again, because it's not going through recombination, when there are mutations or there are mistakes made during replication, that can't be recovered from. And this is what leads to the size difference. Recombination would prevent all this. And it does for all our other genes. But because the Y chromosome never gets to recombine, it essentially is asexual and experiences all the costs of being asexual. It does not benefit from sex like all our other genes do. 
So in summary, there's a lot of costs to sex and some of them are quite large, right? Your fitness has to be double that of the asexual individual to actually have sex evolved. But there are two really important conditions that would lead to that benefit. And the first is when other organisms are evolving to take advantage of you, you have to rapidly evolve to avoid that. And that's the rapid generation of new phenotypes when selection pressures change from generation to generation. And then the other thing that sex does through recombination is it separates genes from their context, from all the other genes around them and allows alleles that are beneficial to spread and allows the elimination of deleterious alleles, okay? So what we've done today is cover why reproduce sexually. Again, there it's not always to your advantage and there are critters that don't do it, um, but there are some big advantages to sex. So now we're gonna move on to why are there different sexes um, and then get into sexual selection. Once you have different sexes, then you can have sexual selection. All right, so I hope that was interesting. I find this stuff so fascinating, and I will talk to you all again soon. Bye.